Good evening, folks. It is lovely to have you joined with us this evening. You're all very, very welcome. Um, I'm just going to start our service this evening reading a couple of verses from 1 Samuel and chapter 2. We heard this morning and we were reminded this morning about the power of God, about God's power to keep his promises, God's power to answer our prayers. And perhaps after hearing that this morning, there's, there's no better passage to read than Hannah's prayer in 1 Samuel chapter 2. She's praying in, in thanks, acknowledging God's power, how he has kept his promises and answered her prayers. So we're just going to read a, a couple of verses as, as we start this evening. So 1 Samuel chapter 2 says, And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. I smile at my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. No one is holy like the Lord, for there is none beside you, nor is there any rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let no arrogance come from your mouth, for the Lord is the God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and those who stumbled are girded with strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, and the hungry have ceased to hunger. Even the barren has borne seven, and she who has many children has become feeble. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and brings up. And we'll, we'll end our reading just there. So we're going to stand together. We're going to praise God. We're going to sing the words of our first hymn, There's a Sound on the Wind. And so we'll stand together and sing. You're very welcome. If you've just joined us during the first hymn there, we're just going to open our, open our service now in prayer. So let's just commit our service to God. Heavenly Father, as, as we meet together now, um, we just remember what we heard this morning, Lord, about, about your power, Lord, and we remember that you are powerful and a holy God and that it is a special thing to be able to meet together freely in your presence, Lord, and we, we thank you that we can draw like this into your presence to hear from you this evening, Lord, and we remember that that is a special thing, Lord. We thank you even that we can turn to you in prayer, knowing that you are a God who listens to us, who wants to hear us prayer, 
to, who wants to hear us pray, Lord, that you're a God who is powerful enough to answer our prayer, Lord, that we can, we can leave our petitions with you knowing that nothing is outside of your control, nothing is outside of, of, of what you can deal with, Lord, and even what feels like a big problem to us, Lord, to you, is, is so easily solved, Lord, because you are so much, so much above us. And so, Lord, we come before you this evening humbly, Lord, just remembering, Lord, that you are a holy and a powerful God and that we are nothing, Lord. And so we thank you that we can draw close to you like that. Lord, you just pray that as we do meet together this evening and consider your word, Lord, as your word is opened and explained to us, Lord, I pray that you would speak to us and that you would bless us. I pray that you would challenge us, Lord, that we wouldn't just hear with our ears, but that this evening we would hear with our hearts, Lord, that your spirit would be at work this evening. And so we just pray for your blessing upon us now in Jesus' name. Amen. So folks, just a few announcements to run through. Um, first of all, just to, to welcome the Reverend Alan Menon. It's been lovely to have you with us for the last little uh, last month now, I suppose it is. And so we're looking forward to what you share with us this evening. But um, just you're very welcome. Um, so just to run through some announcements for the week ahead, it's going to be a very busy week. There's lots on. Um, our missionary weekend starts... Thomas. Oh, sorry. Good evening and welcome. <laughs> All I saw was a wave and then I got a wee bit confused. Sorry. You're, you're very welcome. Um, so our, our missionary weekend starts on Wednesday. Um, we have good news for everyone, formerly known as the Gideons, with us on Wednesday evening. So if you're free on Wednesday evening, it would be, it would be great to see you out for that. Um, then on Thursday morning, as normal, we have our Thursday morning prayer time. Friday evening, we have Missionary Aviation Fellowship, and there will be something on for the kids that evening as well. So don't feel that only one of you can come out or you can't come out. Come out as a family, bring everyone. There's, there's something there for the, for the children to take part in. And then next Sunday, um, both services, morning and evening, we have the Child Evangelism Fellowship um, coming along to take both services. Next Sunday morning, we have our Sunday school starting back up again, 10.15. So everyone from age 3 up to age 17 is welcome for Sunday school. So that's starting back up again and everything's getting moving again after the summer. Um, on Saturday at 10 o'clock in the morning, we have scheduled a bit of a work day. So if you are available... Come down, wear some old clothes and be ready to sort of get stuck into some jobs around the church and around the manse. So that's Saturday morning at 10 o'clock if you are available for that. Um, some extra announcements then. Um, the small group Bible study will be back on on Monday the 12th of September. Um, a date for slightly further away, the Time Out Ladies Bible study will be back up again on Thursday the 22nd of September. Um, we have a members meeting coming up on the 11th of October, but in preparation for that, at the last members meeting, three diagonal vacancies were declared. And if you are going to nominate someone to stand for election for the diagonal, you have to have spoken to them, and they have to pass, have passed on their nomination by the 11th of September. So that gives you a couple of weeks. So there are three vacancies. Ralph's term is up, and my term is up, and one further vacancy was declared and so if if you're going to do that you've got until the 11th of September I think that's all of the announcements this evening and um, if I have forgotten something pick up a wee announcements sheet on your way out and you'll you'll get a chance to check that I didn't miss anything and um, so I'm now going to hand over to Reverend Alan Menon. I'm going to take a seat and he's going to see us through to the end I think so thank you very much thank you well good evening how are we doing? Nice to see all your smiling faces. And those of you who are not smiling, you're welcome to. <laughs> um, let's pray together. God, our Father, we, we pause to thank you for who you are and the fact that you have revealed yourself to us through your word and through your Son, our Savior, Jesus. Father, we thank you for your word. It is able to make us wise unto salvation. It is able to tell us who you are. It enables us to fall in love with you. Father, I pray that tonight as we look again at the story of Genesis, that you might open our eyes, that we might see wondrous things out of your law. For yours is the kingdom and yours is the power 
and yours alone is the glory. And we pray in Jesus' precious name. And all God's people said, Amen. Well, are we becoming a little expert in the book of Genesis? Um, I hope you have with you the study guide and your Bible. Um, study guide, you'll want to turn to page 31. That will be the section that we'll be looking at tonight. And also the commentary towards the end of the book. One of the things that we didn't get into, nor will we, nor does time really allow us to do it, is um, how we should view uh, the people of Israel today. And there is an addendum at the back of the book, at page 98 or thereabouts, that basically traces the, uh, the occupation of Israel and postulates um, some conclusions on the basis of that. Uh, so you can have a look at that in your leisure, and if you have ever any questions, I'll be happy to, uh, to discuss it with you. And there's some, in, I don't know why it's in tiny little print at the bottom of that page, but for some reason it is some of the conclusions that we've drawn. Um, so tonight what we want to do is deal with the last portion of the book of, of Genesis. Now, remember that the, the Old Testament it's such an exciting book. I remember one of my professors a long time ago at the University of Edinburgh. He came to me and he said, um, he said, Mr. Meenan, in his uh, inimitable Scottish accent that I cannot reproduce. Um, Mr. Meenan, he said, I've just been reading a great introduction to the New Testament. It's called the, um, the, um, uh, the Old Testament. I always thought that was a cute thing to say, you know, because the Old Testament really is a marvelous introduction to the New Testament. And the, the Old Testament, essentially these are the major thrusts of the Old Testament. Even though it's, um, it's got 30, it's much larger, of course, than the New Testament, but it's, it's filled with exciting stories and great poems and and great prophecies uh, that, that, that point beyond, the page, beyond its pages to the pages of the New Testament and to Jesus Christ himself. Um, so, uh, and my, my area of, uh, of study uh, has been really in the area of Old Testament. Um, although I'm, uh, I hope you realize, I mean, I'm very happy with the New Testament as well. But... Uh, um, the Old Testament fascinates me. It's an incredible book and a uh, series of books. And basically what it does, it begins the story. It introduces us to God with creation. And then the, the story of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then the bondage. And, and of course, Genesis is going to finish with the patriarchs. And Exodus is going to begin a new story. Exodus begins with a statement, Now, the Pharaoh did not know Joseph. Because Joseph, as we will see tonight, is an incredible character. He saves civilization in many ways in the ancient world. And he saves the people of, of Egypt. And they are greatly indebted to him. And they give him and his family, the best of the land of Egypt and the land of Goshen. So it was, it's, it's just there to be enjoyed. They were, they were honored. They were celebrated. Uh, Joseph was a great hero to the nation. And something changes drastically between chapter 50 of Genesis and the first chapter of Exodus. Because there was a pharaoh in Egypt who did not know Joseph. And so we move into a whole new chapter, beginning in Exodus, and it takes us through the story of the bondage, and then throughout the rest of the, uh, the Pentateuch, first five books of the Bible, you have the wilderness wandering, leading up to the beautiful story of Moses looking over the Jordan uh, to the promise of God 
in the land of promise. What would become Israel? I remember I stood there with a group of people years ago and I had the most wonderful little devotional planned as we looked across the Jordan to this land of promise. But the clouds came down (laughs) and we sat there and we couldn't see a thing. We couldn't see about 50 yards in front of you and I threw my little devotional away. I thought that's no use. And so I just invited anybody, if anybody wanted to say anything, you know, you become the devotional. And there was one lady in my congregation who said something that I would never forget. She said, even though we cannot see the promise, we know it's there. And I think that's a powerful thing that as we look at the God who made the promise, and we're going to see it again and again through the story of Joseph. The promise that was made to Abraham, continued to Isaac and to Jacob, reaches its culmination. After we leave the Pentateuch, of course, there's the, la- the conquest and, um, and the period of the judges. The period of the judges is summed up in the closing verses of the book, when everyone did what was right in their own eyes, and there was total chaos as a result. And, and they constantly fell into uh, captivity, and God constantly brought them out of captivity. And eventually, they wanted a king like all the other nations. And so we move into the period of the monarchy. The United Kingdom, three kings. The divided kingdom. The surviving kingdom. And then eventually... We move into the exile. The people are taken away. So remember we mentioned that when Jesus came preaching the kingdom of God, this was the concept that he had in mind where God was king, people were his subjects, and there was a place, the land of promise. But every time they went into exile, they were in bondage, the kingdom of God was eclipsed. And so Jesus came preaching, the kingdom had come. There was a king, a people, and a place. This time the place was in the human heart. And so you have Zerubbabel and Ezra and Nehemiah. So the Old Testament is fascinating, you see. Um, don't ever be afraid of it. Don't, don't think it's beyond comprehension. It's, um, it's wonderful, com- comprehensible. It's wonderfully um, engaging. Um, uh, story after story. You know, when I was uh, a young father, I would uh, tell my, I would put my kids to bed at night and tell them Bible stories. Well, after you tell them the stories of David and Moses and, you know, all the rest of it, you run out, you know, it's stories to tell. And so I began looking for, um, for, out-of-the-way stories, unfamiliar stories. And so my girls were, were raised with these little stories. And I remember we went on holiday one year, and, uh, and they were teenagers. They all wanted tucked in, just, you know, they were, they were being funny. You know, they want tucked in. I said, okay, what, what, um, what do you want me to tell you tonight? What story? And they said, tell us the story of Josephat. <laughs> so I would tell them again these rather uh, out of the way but wonderfully engaging stories. So those of you who are grandparents, those of you who are young parents, get to know these stories. They're fascinating and raising your children on them are really marvelous. And then we have 400 years of silence and then Christ. I do want to commend the Old Testament to you. Not as, a, book, not as a, a testament that you are fearful of or is beyond comprehension. It is really, really super. So uh, take your time. Now, I understand that most people who start in Genesis and, you know, you get as far as, if you're fortunate, maybe Leviticus. You know, and then you say, well, enough of this. Um, go beyond those. Go into the books of Kings and Chronicles. Um, books of Samuel, um, uh, 
Read the prophets as they relate to the stories of the history of Israel. And you will you'll benefit immensely from, from Old Testament. Now the Old Testament we have said, basically there are three major sections. This is easy to comprehend. You've got the historical books, the wisdom books, and the prophetic books. And we've pointed out before that there are five books of the law um, followed by 12 other historical books for a total of 17 books. And we have five books of wisdom. Oh, isn't that convenient? They even get, the names get bigger and bigger as you, as you go down. And five major prophets. And I try to kind of draw a diamond around those to remind you how to put them together. And then 12 minor prophets. A total of 39 books. Okay, we have said already that uh, old is three letters, testament is nine, 39 books. And if you can think in terms of those three major divisions, you have the Old Testament. Simple as that. Uh, the wisdom books, for the most part, are poetic. Um, appealing to the emotions. And the historical books, for the most part, are prose, appealing to imagination, storytelling, you know? And one of the things that, that, that surely we do in Ireland is tell stories, probably better than any other country of the world. We are storytellers, you know? So we're engaged by this. The prophetic books, well... Somebody, sometimes people read them just for the blessed little thought that they get out of it. But if you try to find out when the prophet was speaking and to what situation he was speaking, you begin to understand the prophets and you begin to really appreciate them so much. So, Genesis, essentially, we've said, is about creation, fall, and flood, and about the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph is not a patriarch per se. We'll come to that in a moment. The three patriarchs are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob has, hmm, how many sons? Twelve. Same number as minor prophets, the same number as historical books, same number of disciples, and so on. Twelve. Um... And the book, one of the things we look for in studying the Old Testament, studying any book in the Bible, we try to have a concept of the entire book. Okay? One of the things I want to encourage you going away from this study is whatever book in the Bible you're reading, read the entire book. Read it in its entirety and try to, try to capture the message of the writer. The writer is, 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 is writing for a particular purpose. Sometimes they tell us what the purpose is. You know, John, for example, in his gospel says, I'm writing these things in order that you might believe. And in believing, you might have life. And sometimes the purpose is implicit, but there's always a purpose. And so when we read a book, we read it from beginning to end. You don't read a little verse here, and then another little verse over here, and a little verse here, and so on. You read it, you start at the beginning, and you read it to the end. And when you've done that, then you start looking for major, mm, the major thoughts, the major divisions within the book. That's what we're doing here. And so in the book of Genesis, we discovered there are two major divisions within the book. And there's a very distinct break between the two. First 11 chapters have to do with primeval history. The second part of the book, from chapters 12 to 50, has to do with patriarchal history. The first part of the book has to do with four major events. Creation, fall, flood, and Babel. Right? And the second part of the book has to do with four major characters. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Then we will find within the book, subdivisions, if you will. 
We found the major divisions, there are two. And then we will find within the book certain particular concerns. Certain divisions. There's going to be a division which, which we've looked at already, the story of Abraham, which begins at chapter 12. And, oh, we said that there were 39 chapters in the second part of the book. Interesting. Immediately we learn that, that there's something there that hits us right away from the, from the, the writer. If he's writing, 30, giving 39 chapters to four people, and he's giving 11 chapters to everybody else in the entire world. Then his interest is on the four people. So we ask the question, why? Because he's interested in one nation rather than all nations. I'm talking about the writer now. Interested in the nation of Israel. 39 chapters and three Major divisions within that. The story of Abraham, 13 chapters. The story of Jacob, a little bit of Isaac, 13 chapters. And a little bit of Joseph, 13 chapters. Convenient. So, we're going to be looking at this Joseph section. The last 13 chapters in the book. First week, we looked at the first 11 chapters, right? Second week, we looked at Abraham, 13 chapters. Um, sorry, 11 chapters first week. 13 chapters. And then Joseph, Jacob last week, we looked at about 13 chapters. And tonight, we're going to look at the last 13 chapters. The story of Joseph. And a God who is in control of everything. Now, you remember I said that Genesis, very conveniently, the author has divided the book up for us. It makes, makes the job of trying to see the major movements within the book easy. And he does that by way of what we call Toledoths. And a Toledoth is simply, these are the generations of. So every time the writer says, now, these are the generations of, what he's doing is he's finishing one story and he's beginning another story. It's very convenient. And so our story begins tonight with the story of Joseph. So if you turn in your Bible to chapter 37, you will find right at the beginning of that chapter, verse 2. This is the history of the family of Jacob. So we are now finishing the story of Jacob and beginning the story of Joseph. And if you will look at verse 3, now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his children. Ah, 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 ah. Oh, we've read that before. That was the trouble with Jacob, wasn't it? Um... There was favoritism in the, sorry, Isaac and Rebecca. Favoritism in the family. Rebecca, she loved Jacob. Isaac, he loved Esau, right? I'm glad we're still awake, all right. And as a result of that, family squabbles, difficulties, favoritism. So here again, we're going to be introduced to favoritism. It leads to family conflicts. We saw it over in chapter 25. We're going to see it again. Now, Jacob had 12 sons. He had, um, he had them by means of three ladies. You remember? Leah, Rachel, Bilhah, and Zilpah. Six sons with Leah. Two sons with Rachel. Now this is kind of interesting because I don't want to get into this in any great detail except to say that there are 12 sons of Jacob. Jacob's name, remember at the Jabbok? 
he meets with God. He was struggling with meeting with Laban. He was struggling meeting with Esau, thinking that he was going to be killed by his brother after all that he had done for him. But the real person that he had to encounter was God himself. And God met him by the Jabbok River, and they wrestled until the breaking of day. And in the course of that, God said to him, what is your name? In other words, you know, names in the, in the Bible are very, very important. So he's basically saying to him, who are you? What is your character? What are you? Who are you? And Jacob said, my, my name is Cheater. That's who I am. I'm Sir Planter. I am, I am, as I mentioned last week, I'm scum of the earth. And God said to him, no longer. No longer will your name be Cheater. I am going to make you a prince with God. I will give you the name Israel. And so he becomes really the father of the nation of Israel. Are we together? And he has 12 sons. Now then, it's a little difficult when it comes to the 12 tribes because um, you never hear of the tribe of, uh, of Joseph. You hear of the tribes of his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And so you think, oh, okay, um, 12 sons, uh, uh, Esau, Manasseh, that's 13. So there are 13 tribes? Oh, well, you know, it's, scholars are all over the place with this one. They have great fun with this, you see, because they say, well, maybe the Levites don't count because they didn't get any lands, see. But they do count. They are, in fact, a tribe tribe of Levi. And then they say, well, maybe Manasseh and, and, and uh, Ephraim, maybe they're not really tribes. They're, they're, they're maybe um, branches. There's a good word. They're branches. <laughs> not really tribes. And the tribe is Joseph. But the Bible doesn't refer to a tribe of Joseph. So, let's just say, between you and me, I'm not quite sure how many tribes there are. But there are 12 sons of Jacob. That's what is important to remember. Now the interesting story, of course, of Joseph. The story is amazing, isn't it? This is a great story for bedtime. This is one of the great stories in the Bible. And the language that it uses, oh, you know, it's just, it, it, it pictures, it, it paints pictures that, that defy the imagination and you say when I grow up I want to be just like Joseph except I don't want to go to prison you know apart from that Joseph is quite a character and why is it that the writer chooses to tell the story of Joseph hmm when have you ever thought of that wouldn't it be better to tell the story of Judah because Jesus is going to come from the tribe of Judah. Wouldn't that make more sense? <laughs> well, not when you realize that Judah's two sons are <sighs> characters and God just kills them. And uh, Judah has to go to bed with his daughter-in-law. I mean, you're beginning to think, no, I, don't, I don't think we want my children to hear that at bedtime. We'll tell them another story. Hey. Why Joseph? Because Joseph is the means whereby the promise is maintained. If it weren't for Joseph, you wouldn't be here tonight. Isn't that not amazing? If it weren't for Joseph, you wouldn't be here. If it weren't for Joseph, there would be no tribes of Israel. Because a famine broke out in the land. And it were, if it weren't for Joseph, Israel, Jacob, call him what you will, and all his sons would have starved to death and their families. There'd be no tribes of Israel. There'd be no Israel. There'd be no Jesus. There'd be no church. There'd be no congregational church in Strayed. Um, and you'd be home watching TV tonight or whatever. So, let's look at this story in a little of its 
lovely detail. You see, Joseph had gone to the, one of those Dale Carnegie courses on how to gain friends and influence people, you say. You know those kind of courses? You know, how to, how to gain friends and influence people. That's, you know. So here is Joseph, you see. He goes to one of these courses. He wants to be really neat to his brothers, you say. So he says, hey, I had a dream. And we were all in a field and each of us was represented by a sheaf of wheat. And guess what, guys? Your sheaves, mine stayed upright and yours all bowed down to me. Oh yes, that's the way to gain friends and influence people. And the brothers, didn't say the brothers just were fed up with him. You know, this father, by the way, of course, said, you know, we all know Joseph in his technicolor coat, favored by the father. Favoritism is a problem within a family. And so what we have is jealousy, rivalry. Oh, more than that. Look, if you will, at chapter 37, verse 8. The brothers said to him, are you indeed to reign over us or have dominion over us? So they <sighs> hated him. So it was more than jealousy. They actually hated him. And his father, you know, um, he said, Joseph, you've got to stop this. Because, you see, Joseph had another dream, right? Uh, behold, he says in verse 9, the sun, the moon, the 11 stars were bowing down to me. Now listen, Joseph, you're going too far with this. You know, you're going to provoke the ire of your brothers. And he said, okay, keep your dreams to yourself. So one day, um, the father said to him, I wonder if you would take this, uh, this food to your brothers out in the pasture land and, uh, and come back and give me a report. And Joseph goes, they had moved to uh, Shechem, and, um, but nonetheless he found them and gave them whatever it was they needed and he brought them back. Um, now, he brought back a bad report to his father, which again did not endear him to his brothers. And so they, when Jacob sent him again to the brothers, they decided they would, hmm, well, what would, they, what would we do? Here's this dreamer. Now, let's just notice something about these dreams. You see, the dreams show the future of the promise. There was no idea at this point that the promise was still in jeopardy. Remember, the entire book of Genesis is telling us again and again that this promise is very fragile if it depends on the promise bearer. Remember, we've got the three elements. We've got the promise giver, the promise, and the promise bearer. You've got to have those three, right? Makes sense, right? But the promise, if the promise doesn't have a promise bearer, then what's the point of the promise? And you can't have a promise unless a promise is given by the promise giver. God is the promise giver. Abraham was the promise bearer. Oh boy, did he screw up with Sarah. And Isaac wasn't any better with Rebecca. And, and to boot, you know, they both lied about, you know, hey, just go there and have sex with Abimelech. It's okay. You know, just say you're our sister. They placed the promise in jeopardy. And the promise was placed in jeopardy because Rebecca was barren, uh, as was Rachel. She was barren. And so every time we read this, we think, my goodness, how can the promise survive? There's no way the promise can survive. Because the promise bearers are messing up all the time. And then when you look at these 12 sons that we saw a moment ago on the screen, you think, oh my goodness, I give up. 
The promise is never going to work. But you see, the one thing that the writer wants you to understand in in reading the book of Genesis is the promise has to depend on the promise giver. Because if the promise depends on the promise bearer, we are, what is it they say? We're up the creek in a canoe without a paddle. Isn't that what it is? Something like that. We're in big trouble. And so here you have a situation where these 12 sons are going to screw everything up beyond measure. But the dream that Joseph has speaks of the future of the promise. Ah, well, we're not at an end of the dreams because as the story continues, what you have is the the brothers all get together and they say, you know, let's, let's just finish. I mean, I'm fed up with this kid and I'm fed up with his dreams. Let's just kill him, right? But Reuben, bless his heart. I am so grateful for Reuben. He said, let's not kill him. Let's just put him in a pit. With the intention that during the night when everyone was sleeping, he would tiptoe and he would rescue his brother. I like Reuben. Reuben was the firstborn to Leah. And he had a good heart. There are two major actors in the story, two major actors among the brothers. We will discover one is Reuben and the other, ah, Judah. Hmm. So they put him in the pit, and then Judah, who is kind of, how would you say, financially savvy, maybe? He sees a way of, uh, instead of killing him, hey, let's make a little bit of money from him. Let's sell him to the Midianites and let them sell him to the Ishmaelites and they can sell him to the Egyptians. We don't care where he finishes up as long as he's out of our hair. And you know the story. How he finishes up in Egypt. How he finishes up in Potiphar's household. Now, by the time we get to chapter 39, he is a great worker. But his problem, you'll find in verse 6 of that chapter, is he's not only a great worker, you know, he's one of those characters that has everything. You know? Uh, He's handsome and good looking man the kind of guys that just make you sick you know who've got it all you know they are the they're the jocks they're the football players you know not only the football players they're the they're the star football players you know they've got all the looks they've got all the girls running after them that's joseph And and interesting, the Bible just doesn't say, you know, he's handsome. No, 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 no. Has to rub your face in it, you see. He's handsome and he's good looking. I thought that was the same thing. But they want to reiterate it. He's a good looking dude. And, of course, attracts the attention of Potiphar's wife, who tries to seduce him. You know, the Bible's a real book. I mean, I make no apology for this. It's a real book. It's not fantasy. It says it like it is. And she constantly, day after day, she says, hey, um, let's go to bed. No, 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 no. I wouldn't do that to my master. And realizing she's not going to get him to bed, she grabs hold of him, and he's so frightened. I guess he's frightened. He just... Drops his cloak and runs. But when master comes home, you'll never believe what happened today. It was Joseph. He tried to seduce me, you know. Oh, okay. Send him to prison. And so Joseph languishes in prison. But even there, by the way, his, he wasn't sentenced 
to, he, I think in all probability in those days he was sentenced to what we would call life imprisonment. And he actually is imprisoned for some 15 years. Now that's a long time. 15 years for something he didn't do. But he was so nice a person that even in prison, the prison guards basically let him look after some of the prisoners. And it just so happened that in the house of Pharaoh, uh, the butler and the baker and the candlestick maker, no candlestick maker. They got bent out of shape with Pharaoh. Our Pharaoh got bent out of shape with the, but the butler and the baker. And he sent them to prison. I wonder what they did, you know? Did the butler slam the, the door on the face of, of, of uh of the pharaoh? I mean, what? Or the baker? I mean, did he? I mean, did he burn one of the cookies? I mean, I mean, wouldn't have taken much to prison. And Joseph gets to look after both of them. You know the story. It's a lovely story. It's just a unique, marvelous story of how each of them had a dream. Ah, I had a dream last night," said the butler. "But there's no one who can interpret the dream for me." Joseph says to him, you know, God can interpret dreams. So tell me what the dream was. Joseph says now in chapter 40, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dream. And so the chief butler told his dream to Joseph. I, I, I dreamed of a vine before me, and on the vine there were three branches. And as soon as it budded, its blossoms shot forth, and clusters ripened into grapes. And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. I took the grapes, and I pressed them, and I made this marvelous wine, and I, I took it to Pharaoh. Oh, said Joseph. Well, the interpretation is simply this. The branches represent days. You've got three days, and Pharaoh is going to restore you to office. Wow. Boy, that's great. Oh, said the baker. Let me tell you my dream. You know, hey, I like your interpretation. You're a good interpreter. I like that interpretation of the chief butler. So here's my dream. And, and so he tells his dream. And Joseph says, sorry. Three days and... You're, you're a goner. You're going to be executed. Well, you know the story. dreams came true or the interpretation came true the butler was restored the baker was executed and I don't know what ever happened to the candlestick maker who never existed in the first place anyway well then interestingly we have here a situation where this ability to interpret, Joseph always said it was God-given. It was God who interprets dreams. And one day the Pharaoh himself had a dream. This could make a marvelous movie, couldn't it? He had, a mar he had this incredible dream. And he dreamed of seven, as I remember it, seven fat cows coming out of the river. Presumably the Nile followed by seven scrawny-looking cows that ate the seven fat cows. And he had another dream very much like that. And he said, hey, is there anybody here can interpret my dream? And all the magicians of Egypt, none of them could interpret the dream. And the butler overheard this, and uh, he remembered and he said, uh, oh, there was a guy in prison who interpreted my dream and 
the baker's dream and was right. Bring him here, said Pharaoh. So Joseph appears before. Now, the interesting thing, at the very last verse of chapter 40, you read these words, 23, verse 23. The chief butler did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. And then two years later, Pharaoh has his dream. And Pharaoh calls and sends for Joseph in chapter 41. And Pharaoh says, I have a dream. Nobody can interpret it. I want you to interpret it. And Joseph says to Pharaoh in verse 16 of that chapter, it's not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. So Pharaoh tells the dream, and Joseph interprets it in verse 25. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he's about to do. And he repeats that in verse 28. God has shown to Pharaoh what he's about to do. And it's interesting, in the rest of that chapter, there's one word that keeps recurring over and over and over again. Look carefully if you want. In verse 29, you see the little word all. Seven years of plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. See that? And all the plenty will be forgotten. You see that? And look at verse 35. Let them gather all the food in the good years. Verse 37. This proposal seemed good to Pharaoh and to all his servants. Verse 39. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has shown you all this, verse 40, you shall be over my house and all my people. And verse 41. Behold, I have set you over all all the land of Egypt. And verse 43, thus he set him over all the land of Egypt. And in verse 44, no man shall lift up a hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And he goes on, it goes on again in verse 46, verse 47, the word all, all, and again look down at verse 54. There was a famine in all lands and in all the land of Egypt. And when all the land of Egypt was famished, Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, verse 56, so when the famine had spread over all the land, Joseph opened all the storehouses. 57, all the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain because the famine was severe over all the earth. Huh. Isn't that weird? What's the writer doing? He's emphasizing the totality of the famine, the totality of what needed to be done, the totality of the number of people who would be involved, the totality of the numbers of nations that would be involved. This was something that was going to cripple the entire world, the entire known world, and that all, all were going to be involved. Uh, this would be a, a type of pandemic that would strike everyone, everywhere, of all time, in all nations. It was that serious. And because it was that serious, Joseph was appointed, well, was honored in so many ways, wasn't he? In Egypt, he was given an Egyptian name, for example. He became the vizier of the nation. We would say perhaps the prime minister of the nation. S only second to the Pharaoh himself. Interestingly, when his father, Jacob, died... The Egyptians mourned the death of Jacob for 70 days. The writer makes that very clear. But what you may not know is that when a pharaoh died, the Egyptians mourned his death 
for 72 days. That's amazing. The father of Joseph was honored by 70 days of mourning. So he was given the insignia of office. Oh, and the Pharaoh made sure that he got a beautiful Egyptian wife. And he was given a beautiful name. So that this one son of Jacob, who was a blessing, who was blessed rather, became a blessing. The purpose of being blessed is never an end in itself. If you are blessed, it is that you might be a blessing to others. And that is true of Joseph. So, what we have here, by way of pulling together some of these thoughts, we have the dreams that Joseph interpreted. Now, the interesting thing was that those dreams did not serve him well. Remember, I jokingly said he took Dale Carnegie's course of how to gain friends and influence people? You see, he was alienating his brothers. He presented them in, uh, with an opportunity to be rid of him. Simple. And he finished up in prison. Fifteen long years passed in prison. And finally, he will meet his brothers, and he gives them the opportunity which they took before to get rid of him, to be rid of his brother Benjamin. Now you remember, Rachel, the love of, of Jacob's life, the great love of his life, bore him only two sons. Joseph and Benjamin. Joseph was, was dead to Jacob's way of thinking. Only Benjamin remained. And so... Joseph tricks his brothers into doing the same thing to Rachel's son as they did to him. But he discovers that they've changed. <laughs> Judah goes as far as saying, you, you, you remember all the trickery that's going on. You know, every time they come, uh, they buy the grain, they leave, and, 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 and Joseph makes sure that all the money they spent on the grain is given back to them. And so when they get back home uh, to Jacob, they, they find all this money, and they say, oh, this is bad. And so they take twice the money back the next time uh, to, 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 to make amends. And, and the, the next time, you know, Joseph will say, you have to bring your, to, to, to prove that you are who you are and say that you are and the family that you have, you've got to bring your, your, son, your uh, brother, your young brother, Benjamin. Well, Jacob isn't going to stand for that. After all, he's lost the only son whom he loved by Rachel, Joseph. The only, the only, the only, bit, the only bit of his life that remained of Rachel, the love of his life, was Benjamin. You think he's going to let Benjamin go? Uh -uh. But the brothers plead with. They say, we can't go back to Egypt. We need more grain. You've got to let us go back. If we don't bring Benjamin back, Judah says, hey, kill my sons. Kill my sons if I don't bring Benjamin back to you. And so off they go. Eventually, Jacob will let, because he has to, because they're out of food. He has to let them go. And he goes, and Benjamin goes with them. And, and you know the story, how uh, Joseph, again, up to his tricks. 
he gets a silver cup and he, he, he gets one of his servants to hide it in the, in the saddlebag of, 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 of Benjamin and, and, and he lets them all go with their money and the, the grain and, and then he chases after them and uh, his soldiers and, and they arrest the, the, the brothers and they say, why would you steal the, the silver cup of, uh, of the vizier? Oh, we haven't, we, we, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't steal the cup. Oh, yes, you did. We, we need to search. By all means. And, and in fact, if you find it, you can have the person who stole it. <laughs> so little, could, little could they have imagined that it was planted. And so Benjamin was going to be executed. No, 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 no. Judah, Judah says, you don't understand, vizier. If we go back without Benjamin, our father will, he'll die. We can't do that. Tell you what, take me instead. Wow! Just think about that for a moment. Take me instead. Boy, have things changed drastically. And so the writer here is, is using a lot of contrast to tell his story. And he does it so beautifully, doesn't he? Because what you have here is when he's in prison, the butler forgets him. But God remembers him. I love this. And when he meets his brothers, they don't recognize him. They have forgotten him. But Joseph remembers them. So there's this, this juxtaposition between forgetting and remembering. And one of the things I love about the book of, of Genesis is the words again and again. I love these words. God remembered. Rebecca was barren. And then I love the words, God remembered Rebecca. Isn't that lovely? Rachel was barren, and God remembered Rachel. And, and Leah became barren after a time. Ah, but God remembered Leah and opened her womb again. So there's this sense of you know, I mean, throughout, throughout the entire book we have, you remember chapter 6? God remembered Noah. This has got to be one of my favorite verses in all the Bible. I just, I just love this sense, God remembered, God remembering. And you know, the interesting thing for me is this concept of remembering God remembered Joseph in prison. And God remembers me. And God remembers you. Don't miss that. That is absolutely, supremely lovely. And oftentimes I think, you know, what, what is Christian faith all about? What's the heart and core of a relationship? Is it not this remembering? And the older I get, you know, the more impressed I am. Because, you know, sometimes we get awfully uptight about what we believe and what the person there believes and can we believe this and, you know, and I have many friends who will tell me, you know, well, you can't, you can't read the New International Version. It's not the right one. You know, you got to ask, it has to be the King James Version. I, I don't know if some of you feel that way, and I'm just, you know, sharing what some of my friends, you know. Or, or you, can't, you, can't, you can't go to heaven unless you're baptized. Oh, no, 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 you can't. Say. Or, or you can't get to heaven unless you believe certain things in a certain way. You know, whether you believe in predestination or whether you believe in free will or... What's this? Premillennial... A millennial, post millennial, uh, pre trib, a trib. What the heck trib? 
you know? And you know, when I think about it, you know what I see, I see in my mind? I see that thief on the cross at Calvary. And all he said, Jesus, remember me. <laughs> I, I doubt that he had his theology worked out. He certainly wasn't baptized. And what did Jesus say? Today you will be with me in paradise. He didn't say, well, too late, you know, I, I should have baptized you. Or, I don't know, are you one of the predestined ones or you're not? You know, no, I'm, I'm not giving away what I believe or what I don't believe. What, what I am saying is sometimes we major on minors. And maybe, maybe this is what it's all about. God, remember me. Remember me, a sinner who's flunked out, who's screwed up. Remember me. And I hear those words of Jesus echoing across the, across the centuries. You'll be with me in paradise. Isn't that lovely? So that's what we have here. Now Joseph, Joseph, what we have is a picture. You remember I told you that Genesis is not about Joseph. It's not about Abraham. It's not about creation. It's about the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of Joseph, the creator God. It's about the God who is providentially working in, in, in human history. It's about the God who changes lives like Jacob, a God who enters into covenant relationship like, like Abraham. It's a story about God. This book, Genesis, is about God. It is an introduction to God. It is the very first, I'm getting too excited. It, 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 it is the very first book in the Bible that introduces us to the God who is the most wonderful creator, redeemer, all those things. Just throw in all the nines that you can. It's introducing you to God and saying, I dare you not to fall in love with the God of the Bible. And here is God of providence. And, and I love the time when, when the brothers realize after Jacob dies, they also, oh, we're in trouble now. You know, boy, here's, you know, we, we, we did a bad thing. And, you know, now, now that father's gone, we're in big trouble. The thing I love about Joseph, he keeps crying all the time. <laughs> you know, things touch his heart. He was a, obviously a very tender spirit. And he sits down with his brothers and he weeps. Tells them who he is. And he said, you know, I know that you meant this for evil. But God meant it for good. You know, that gives me confidence. When bad things happen to good people, when bad things happen in your life, when people mistreat you, when life gets on top of you, when things don't go the way that you want, sometimes people even design evil against you. But God can take the most vile thing and make it good. And that's what the story of Joseph is really all about. So let me just say this. We learn that this God of providence, number one, he works through evil events to bring about good. He's a big God. He doesn't have to just work through the good things. He works through evil events to bring about good. He influences evil acts towards a better outcome. And we see that in the change of heart of his brothers. Number two. God can use people of on faith, wow, to bring about good. Wow. God can use non-believers, non-Christians to bring about good. Do you believe that?
Potiphar wasn't a believer. Uh, the cupbearer, the, the butler, wasn't a believer. Pharaoh wasn't a believer. And number three, God acts ex post facto to effect good. In other words, even things that have happened that are bad in the past, he can bring about good in the future. You know, for most of us, God is, our God is too small. I had the privilege of telling someone that, that last night on the phone. I just said to this lady, you know, I, I hear what you're saying, but your God is too small. Really? No, 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 no. Yes, 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 yes. He's a big God. And the story of Joseph reminds us just that his promises never, ever fail. So dear, Joseph, dear Jacob says in chapter, oh, we're almost at the end. Joseph says, oh, ver, chapter 47, verse 29 and 30. The end of verse 29 don't bury me in Egypt, but let me lie with my fathers. Carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burying place. Now, don't bury me in Egypt. Why? Because the promise was never conditioned on Egypt. It was conditioned on the land of promise. And eventually he had to be carried out of there. And, and Jacob was never at home in Egypt as a result. The covenant doesn't belong to Egypt. The promise doesn't belong to Egypt. The promise belongs to the land promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That is why Jacob says, bury me in Hebron. Interestingly, by the way, that's where Abraham and Sarah were buried. That's where Isaac and Rebekah were buried. And listen to this. That's where Leah was buried. Not Rachel. He's going to be buried with Leah. Not Rachel. Because that is the land. Oh, the, the, this last chapter of the book is so amazingly lovely. Um, you know, there's the blessing of Ephraim and Asa and so on. The chapter, we, don't, we don't have time to get into it. Chapter 49, Jacob calls his sons and each one he blesses. And I love, you know, there's the 12 sons. He blesses, he is a blessing for each one throughout chapter 49. You know, he blesses Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Zebulun, Issachar, Dan, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Joseph, and Benjamin. And then, when Jacob finished charging his sons, the last verse of chapter, of chapter 49, he drew up his feet into his bed, and he breathed his last. Chapter 50, verse 1. Then Joseph fell on his father's face, wept over him, and kissed him. And the physicians embalmed Jacob or Israel. Forty days it took for them to embalm him, and they wept for him seventy days. See that? So Joseph goes and buries his father, and then in the last few verses, Joseph realizes he too has come to the end of his life. And so we read in verse 24, Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die. Now, I love these verses. Look at them very carefully. I'm about to die, but God. I love those two words. They make all the difference in the world. But God will visit you. He will bring you up out of this land, that's Egypt, to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And God will visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. 
And so Joseph died 110 years old. They embalmed him. He was put in a coffin in Egypt. Just look at this as we come to a close. Joseph's death. First thing I want you to notice, he says in verse 24, I'm about to die, but God. Now remember I told you this book was not about Joseph. It's about God, right? So what can you deduce from the statement, I'm about to die, but God? We deduce that God is immortal. Look again at the next statement. God's promise is secure. It tells us that God is faithful. Joseph had this amazing confidence in God in these closing verses. It tells us that God is trustworthy. And I love the fact that he says, carry my bones. When, you, when the time has come for you to leave Egypt, will you carry my bones out of Egypt? Do you realize that for 400 years, the people of Israel carried his dead bones for 400 years so that he could be buried in the land of promise. Because the promise giver was immortal, faithful, trustworthy, and true. His dead bones was a constant reminder to the people of Israel in all their wanderings for 400 years that God was alive. Someone has said this, and I've always remembered it. When a man or a woman of God dies, nothing of God dies. Wow. Think about that. When a man of God dies, when a woman of God dies, nothing of God dies. When you and I die, nothing of God dies. He is immortal. He is faithful. He is trustworthy. He is true. That is the God of the book of Genesis. That is your God and mine. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you that you are the most incredible, wonderful, amazing person, God. Words fail us. These stories remind us just how incredibly wonderful you are. None more than this story of Joseph. And we would want to trust you and love you and more. Follow you no matter what, knowing that we can be totally confident in your love for us. And that everything will be all right. Because we belong to you. No matter what. Will you help each one of us understand more fully who we are and to whom we belong. That we might walk with our heads held high as sons and daughters of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And we pray this in the precious name of our Redeemer, whose name is Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. We'll just stand and sing together then in, in closing our, our, final, our final hymn, An Army of Ordinary People.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for what we can read in Genesis, Lord, of the patriarchs. And we thank you that even this evening, Lord, we can say that the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob and the, the God of Joseph is our God. And that we can stand on your promises, Lord, knowing that you are the promise giver, the promise giver who keeps his promises. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to respond to this, Lord, respond in, in faith and in trust. That even when things are difficult, Lord, that we will still look to you, Lord. We think even of the, the words of Joseph in all of the difficulties that he went through, Lord, that he was able to say, Lord, that you were working through that, Lord, that they meant it for evil, but that the Lord meant it for good. And so, Lord, help us to, to trust in you and give us that simple, childlike and complete trust. Lord, I pray that you would see us to our homes in safety this evening. In Jesus' name, amen.